All right, welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is your host, Rachel Gregory, and I am here with a badass chick by the name of Ashley Van Houten. What's up, Ash? Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations on uh, doing your own podcast. It's pretty awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Ash is um, an expert at podcasting. She's been doing it for how long have you been doing it? I guess it's been going on five years now. Self-proclaimed expert. I'll just call myself an expert because why not? Um, But yeah, I've been doing it a while. I feel like I've I've learned a lot. I'm definitely better. I think if I went back and listened to the first episode I ever did, it would be like extremely painful. So I want (laughs) to say that I'm getting better. I hope I am. So do you want to just host the show today? Uh, nope, that's all you. I, I do this enough. You, this is your job. <laughs> I'm just happy to be here on the other side. I can just talk about myself. It's great. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, you're on, you're going on five years. I'm going on like five episodes. So, but it's fun so far, right? You were saying offline, you're having a good time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving it. It's like, I didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I am. And I'm just like, all right, let's go. Let's go. So it's yeah. fun. I, I think for nerds who like to learn, <laughs> like this is one of the best ways to do it, right? Because you get to reach out and talk to people that you want to talk to and people that, you know, if you have questions that you want answered, you get to go do that in this kind of awesome one-on-one setting. And then you're helping other people and, and putting that information out to other people too. It's like win-win for everybody. Yeah, exactly. That's something that I didn't even like really think about when I actually thought about starting a podcast. I was just like, okay, I want to, you know, start something new. And as I'm going and learn, I'm like, wow, I literally just learned so much in that last hour of talking to that one person. And it was like, why haven't I been doing this forever? So I'm <laughs> yeah, excited. It's, like, it's, it's exhausting, and, but also you feel super smart at the end of mm-hmm. it because you're like, whoa, I just got like literal, like a personal one-on-one uh, lesson from somebody yeah. super smart, except for in this case, because I'm not oh, please. super smart. But when you talk to like real smart people, you're going to learn a lot. Oh my gosh. Uh, no. Well, okay. So before, well, I have a bunch of awesome things that I want to chat with you about. And before we get started, why don't you just give like a background, kind of just a little intro into who you are, why you're badass, all that jazz. Cool. <laughs> um, well, you, yes, it's, it's, it's yet to be determined if I'm a badass. You can decide for yourself at the end of this, this chat, but I'm going to see if I can turn this intro as, as quickly as I can. So basically, right now, I am a writer and an editor and a podcaster Um, in the health and fitness space. And essentially, I got here through kind of a very long and persistent process of trying to meld together like the things that I'm good at with the things that I'm passionate about. So my background academically and professionally was always marketing and communications and writing. Um, And I always was just a naturally really curious person. I love to ask questions. I love to learn and I love to share what I've learned with other people. And so that was my sort of formal background marketing and um, master's degree in marketing and and in the corporate communications world. And also alongside that, I've always loved fitness and being strong and learning about how to be healthier and fitter and and just have the healthiest life possible. So um, that was something that I always kind of pursued as the the fun side of my life while I was doing my, my real work. And it wasn't until sort of a few years into a really corporate job in New York, I was working like downtown financial district, like doing the thing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that like, this was going to be my life forever working super long and having to wear like real clothes and like, you know, it just wasn't, I just saw. What were you working at? So I I was doing uh, corporate communications for an insurance company. Oh, okay. And I was originally in um, Bermuda, which is where my mother's from. And that's kind of a big um, corporate communication sort of hub in Bermuda, which is a random fact that people probably wouldn't know. But I had moved there and was working in this corporate world. I was moved to the office in New York and it was really exciting. I was in my early 20s and I was like kind of mm-hmm. thinking I was a big deal and like making a lot of money and working really hard. And But it wasn't anything I was passionate about. I was doing something that I was good at in an industry that I cared nothing about. Um, and so I was starting to see the sort of disconnect between like, I could stay here forever because I'm making good money and I'm pretty good at what I'm doing, but I have zero interest in this. I have no passion. And the more that I was spending time like socially in that community and going to events and going to trade shows and workshops and seeing people 
like who really enjoyed what they were doing and they loved hanging out with each other and they'd work all day and then they'd go out together all night. And I was like in my own personal hell. And I'm just like, am I just <laughs> that much of an introvert that I don't want to be around these people or is some, something wrong with me? And it wasn't until later when I moved into this industry and I love every day that I work that I'm like, I just needed to find the thing that I was good at. So I sort of moved from communications into a more creative editorial publishing role painstakingly by just writing and pitching and putting myself out there and and just kind of doing it slowly and it took probably seven years until i went from having like a real nine to five job to being being able to sustain myself in a sort of like freelance consulting capacity um so there's like a lot of time that that <laughs> spans in between there but basically it was like persistence and just kind of constant focus on what do I actually like to do and how can I apply the things that I'm good at to that world to like offer something to the world and also be doing something that fulfills me. So, you know, skip ahead many years. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I write predominantly for paleo magazine. I host their podcast. I've hosted it for about five years now. Um, and I am kind of sort of building my own brand and, and offering different things to people, which we can get into later. Uh, I offer um, consulting work for other smart, awesome individuals in the fitness world who are doing their own podcasts or building their own brands. And I kind of work a little bit behind the scenes for them. Um, so I've got a lot going on and no one day is the same and I love mm -hmm. it. And um, it's like a hustle every day, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, but I wouldn't change it. So I'm very, I'm very grateful to be where I am. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like we're, we're very similar I was kind of in the same boat when I first got out of grad school. I started a job in like the supplement industry. I was looking for a nutrition and I was in the supplement industry working as like, my title was nutrition scientist. Um, and I like, even just after a year, I was like, this is not what I want to be doing. Like, it was just not yeah. like it, like you said, it paid the bills. It was good money. Um, and I was just like, no, like I can't do this anymore. So yeah. I was kind of Sim we have similar, a little bit similar backgrounds. You're obviously a little more experienced, but um, I don't love that. But we, it's it's why we get along so well because we've we met. Um, you know, I guess it was last year KetoCon, right? Yeah. That we met because I like managed to sneak my way into VIP dinner, and uh, I was there with all the cool people, and and we kind of hung out and spent some time together. I'm like, all right, this this chick's cool. We got to be friends. Yeah. I love how those things work out. That's why I love events like that. See, when I was going to other events like that in a different industry, mm -hmm. I would not make friends with anybody because I was miserable. Yeah. yeah. And like these conferences are like, I don't even look at them as conferences. They're just like family reunions now, yeah, just based totally. off like the last few years of like all the people who go to them. I'm just like, I'm excited. Like this is a vacation. I get to go hang out with my friends and, and all that and learn all the work. Stuff. It's great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about, so you said that you came out of the job that you were in and did you go right to paleo magazine or no, so basically I, I had started to make the move from communications to publishing, which most people do the opposite because people who grow up and love to read and write want to be journalists so they want to be authors. And then the world kind of beats them down and tells them that no one can make money being a writer and the publishing industry is going away and you know, no one does it. So they all go into communications instead because it has the same sort of skill set, but there's more money. I went the opposite way. I did the like the practical thing first and then moved into publishing. So I basically, again, I was living in New York and I kind of just sent out a bunch of resumes and did a bunch of interviews and I worked where I could work. And I, I actually ended up um, in publishing in the interior design and architecture world for a while, which is another quite interesting industry that I, I really actually quite enjoyed, but it still, it still really wasn't my passion, but I learned about writing and the editorial process. And I learned about um, working and, and, and making my own way sort of in New York. So that was cool. And as I was doing that, alongside that was this parallel of me learning about CrossFit, for example. So I got really into CrossFit after university in New York when it was starting to kind of just like start, just starting to kind of crest. Mm -hmm. in 2008, 2009, there was like one CrossFit gym in New York and it was like gross and dirty and it was like the whole thing. Um, so I was starting to do that. And then I was starting to learn about like the zone diet first. And then I got into paleo and then I learned about paleo magazine. And I actually ended up reaching out to the editor, Kane, um, because I was doing a, uh, a publishing course in school. I was doing my master's degree and I had to do like a case study on a magazine. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, Vanity Fair probably isn't going to answer me, but I'm interested <laughs> in this magazine. It seems a little bit smaller. Maybe he'll actually talk to me. And he did. And he let me kind of learn from him. And so we, we established this kind of relationship. And then like, 
a year later, a restaurant opened up in New York called Hugh Kitchen, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And it was sort of touting itself as the first paleo restaurant. And Kane was like, hey, you live in New York. I know you. Do you want to write about this? And I was like the first person to write about the restaurant when it opened. It was the first thing I did for the magazine. Um, and I kind of just steamrolled from there. And after that, it was about me pitching again to Kane saying, why don't you do this for the magazine? Why don't I start this column? Like, this is missing. Why don't I write about this? I was creating from the very beginning, like creating work for myself. But if it's real, like if it's really actually valuable stuff that you think will, will help people, I mean, it panned out and he let me do it. And he's kind of just kept letting me do it ever since. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's kind of how it worked out. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So were you always kind of in, into like nutrition and fitness, like growing up or was there a transition there? I wasn't, I didn't care about nutrition until I had to, to be honest with you. Like it's a classic story of like, you eat whatever you want and do whatever you want until you hit 25 and your metabolism like knocks on the door and you're like, oh, you should probably take care of yourself. So I'll be honest. I mean, I, I've always loved food. I've always loved to eat. And I've never, I, I've never really been a picky eater necessarily. I've been very fortunate that I've never had any, um, issues or sensitivities that like necessitated that I had to eat a certain way. So I just mm -hmm. kind of, it literally wasn't even a thought my entire life. Um, I always cared about fitness and being strong and working out, but I also never really identified as like an athletic person until probably outside of like after university, because I didn't do a lot of team sports. Like I did like the classic, like your mom makes you play soccer for a couple of years and you, you do whatever at school. Cause you, you know, but yeah. I, I wasn't, I didn't really like lean towards team sports ever. And I think that there is, and this is changing now, but I think it's used to be sort of like, if you weren't doing team sports, like you're not really an athlete. Like if you swim or if you are a runner, I mean, certainly you are an athlete, but it mm -hmm. kind of, it feels a little different. Yeah. Right. And all the sports that I always did, like I, it was gymnastics when I was a kid and then I was into swimming and then post-university I got into CrossFit and then I moved into powerlifting and then I moved into bodybuilding and all of them were sort of relatively individual sports. And so it wasn't until I started kind of competing in some of these things that I was like, I'm, maybe I am kind of athletic. Maybe I'm not really like a real athlete, but I'm pretty athletic. I like this stuff. <laughs> Um, and so I kind of just dabbled in a lot of things and, and played around with a lot of stuff, but it gave me a really good basis of strength and just mm -hmm. body awareness and understanding. Um, and yeah, so as these things were, were happening and as I was growing and learning, I, I thought like, okay, well, why don't I just start like really digging into it and, and start getting paid to do some of this stuff and start like learning about it in earnest and like really doing it instead of just mm -hmm. kind of making it like a fun thing I do a couple of days a week and um, yeah, that's, it's still going. Yeah. That's awesome. I think we kind of have similar, <clears throat> sorry, similar stories. Like the way that you said you went from CrossFit to power, powerlifting to bodybuilding. And I actually did gymnastics as well when I was younger. Yeah. Um, but I was, <laughs> my mom like forced me to do it. And I was like the girl who was wearing like shorts and a t-shirt at gymnastics. Well, we're not into the little unitards. I think I, I think that might've been my favorite part. <laughs> That was like the opposite. Like I literally wouldn't wear them. Oh, I was like no. a tomboy growing up. I wanted to play basketball. I played basketball and, and softball. Those are my two main sports. But yeah, my mom like wanted me to do gymnastics and I was like such a rebel. I was like, I'm not wearing that stupid thing, the leotard, That's whatever you call it. Well, um, that I have a question for you now, because of course I can't not ask questions, but <laughs> I think one of the, like, and I think we're probably around the same age, but you know, when I talk about being into like muscles and working out at a young age, I, it's not like I'm 50 and I was the first person at my gym, like the first woman to do a bicep curl. Like, it's not like it was that revolutionary, but I will say when I was working out, I mean, it was almost 20 years ago that I started working out as a teenager mm -hmm. and there were women in the gym, but it was very different, a very different climate than it is right now. And people were doing things very differently. There were way fewer of them. And it was still seen like the women who were in there actively trying to get big, strong muscles were like a fringe group. Mm -hmm. There's like a couple of these like bodybuilder women over in the corner. And now it's like you go to any gym, meathead or otherwise, and it's probably more women than men. And they're all in there like squatting their double their body weight and stuff. Like yeah. it's a very different, very different environment. But I never really felt like I didn't belong there or I didn't deserve to be there. And I don't, maybe I credit that with either just being like completely oblivious or, you know, I had an older brother. And so I grew up like watching athletic stuff all the mm -hmm. time and watching um, 
sports and wrestling and MMA and like all of this stuff. And even if I didn't really see myself represented, I just, I never really thought like that's something I couldn't do. It just, when I was ready, I went and I did it. So I, I wonder if that's even like a question for many women today, like young women who are starting mm -hmm. today. Do you think that that's something that, that they contend with or not really? I feel like it's definitely different. Um, like for me, I was really like, I was kind of the opposite. Like I was into team sports, like that was my thing. So I wasn't, I didn't really end up going to the, like the only gym I can remember going to in high school was I would do like some lifting stuff outside of sports. And then towards the end of high school, I started going to like the New York sports club. But even at that time, I was like the one in there, like on the treadmill running, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I feel like nowadays it's like, it's getting better. Um, especially yeah. with like women realizing that, you know, if you want to change your body and actually look the way you want to look, can't just be like running on the treadmill. You have to actually go like lift up a weight. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's getting better, but I feel like, I don't know. I'm, and also it was a little different for me too. Cause I talked to some of my friends who like, even like my friends in college who grew up playing sports and stuff and they like would lift, right. Like for their sports, they would, um, lift and do things outside of just the sport itself. For me, I like, I played basketball very competitively in high school and we didn't ever lift. Like we, mm -hmm. and I don't know if this is because I went to a very small high school in like the heart of New York and Manhattan and literally like our lifting room was, I was like upstairs and it was like one, um, rusty barbell. Remember. Yeah. It wasn't even, there wasn't even a barbell. It was like one machine. So we never yeah. did that. But then I like talked to my other friends who grew up in like the suburbs or like at other places and they went to bigger schools that had bigger facilities and they, you know, all, not all of them, but a lot of them lifted alongside their sport because mm. their coaches were smart and were like, okay, well they need right. to get stronger. Right. So I feel like maybe that was a little disconnect because of where I grew up. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like now it's becoming like more and more like normal, right? Yeah. Especially. Yeah. With, I mean, yeah. It, we also find ourselves in a bubble too, because being in the industry and in the world that we're in, we, we aren't really around like the general population in terms of like talking about fitness or going to the gym or whatever. And I think sometimes you, we can kind of get a broader look at what's really going on outside of our sort of small subsection and, and realize that these changes do happen, but they take longer than mm -hmm. we think. Like, you know, you being a, a figure in the keto world, you know that there is still a ton of misinformation and a ton of reticence to accept eating healthy dietary fat. Like that is still a thing, mm -hmm. even though like all of this research, this like old outdated research has been debunked, even when seeing so many people thriving on higher fat and all of that stuff. I mean, people still have such a hard time and, and opinions take a really long time to change. So I think that just being sort of, one of the things I've learned over the last few years anyway, is to, to be a little bit more patient with yourself and with other people and to just sort of live your life the best way you know how. And people, like we were saying offline, they'll come to you when they see you doing well or they see you trying something that's interesting to them instead of saying like, hey, lift a fucking weight, please. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't be afraid of fat. Like when you're, that kind of approach only works mm -hmm. so well with few people. It's more just like, just do your thing, have the information there when they want it and they'll yeah. come to you when they're ready kind of situation. Yeah, exactly. And just, yeah, just kind of like, le like, you know, that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast and with, you know, my kind of brand is just like, try to show people like what, what you can do. And instead of like telling them, I'm trying to educate them more and un to understanding like why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and I've just seen like over, you know, even the other day, someone responded to one of my posts and was like, how did like, how do you like, how do your arms look like that? <laughs> and I was like, it was like, it was, it was a, a woman and I was like, well, I lift weights. And she's like, oh, I really want your arms. I was like, okay, well, and lift weights. Know, go lift some weights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I, you sh yeah. yeah, I get the same, like, I mean, I get the same thing. I tell the story all the time. It's not like it's a exciting or new story, but I've been approached in the gym before by women who, and I appreciate anybody 
reaching out to anybody at the gym to ask some questions because I think it takes some guts sometimes, especially mm -hmm. for women who are in there and don't feel comfortable in the gym. Um, and I've had more than one woman come up to me and say like, you know, what do you, what should I do in the gym to like build some muscle and like look toned and not get bulky? And I always straight up ask them, I'm like, be honest with me, okay? Like, do I look bulky to you? You can tell me yes, you can tell me, but I'm assuming that you can't, you know, they came to me because they don't think I look bulky. Yeah. And they're like, no, you look great. I'm like, I'm lifting the heaviest weights that I possibly can all the time. I'm working so hard to bulk up and mm -hmm. this is where it falls, right? So like, just, just do what you enjoy. Just lift heavy, like work hard. Mm -hmm. It's like the intensity more than a number. It's the intensity more than a specific movement. It's just, just go in there and work hard. Don't be afraid to like, fail at it. Don't be afraid to get sweaty and have to like grunt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like that's what effort is, you know? So, yeah. um, I think, yeah, but I think just the more, more women who are out there doing it and just telling yeah. people what they're doing, you know, that's, that's how it, that's how the message gets out. Yeah, for sure. And it's never too late. Like, for example, I have been telling my mom to go to the gym and lift some weights forever. She's always been into like spinning and that's her thing. And she finally like, cause I kind of went through like my own, like transformation last year and my sister went through her own transformation she st finally started lifting weights after years of just you know going on the treadmill or the elliptical and she's like she lost 20 pounds she obviously changed her diet too but she lost 20 pounds she's like wow this is amazing like I didn't realize how much I enjoyed lifting weights and I can literally see my body changing how it's never changed before and so my mom's like oh dang so she hired a trainer in January at her gym and so she's been lifting she's 65 i believe yeah. and so she's been lifting since the beginning of january and she is like i talked to her the other day and she's like i have never felt this strong in my life and i'm like so awesome yeah and she's like i can already see my my clothes are fitting better like i just feel good and i'm just like thank you finally after years like you're finally catching on and i feel like once people catch on it like it becomes addicting because you're like this yeah. is like, I love this. And it's also kind of, it, it is intimidating at first. Right. And it's, it's intimidating for, for anybody, but like, yeah. honestly, when you walk in the gym, like no one cares, like no one's looking at yeah. you. They're looking at their self. They're looking in the mirror. Like they're they don't care about phones, you. Probably. They're looking at their phones. Right. <laughs> yeah. They don't care. So as yeah. long as you go in there and obviously you have to be safe and know what you're doing. Um, so I would say like, you know, educate yourself on that. And like, if you've never, you know, picked up a barbell before, probably, don't go for the barbell first. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the education piece, but, um, I just want to ask you, so I know that you kind of got into bodybuilding down the road, um, after CrossFit and all that. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Because that's actually something that I'm super interested in now. Um, and I kind of want to just get your experience, get your experience and, and kind of where you're, where you're, can't talk where you are at now with that. You've been talking a lot this week. I don't blame you. Yeah. Um, I could talk forever about this subject and I, I do want to talk about some other things. So I'll try not to be like too long winded, but I, I have like a slightly different experience probably than the average, um, woman in terms of getting into bodybuilding. But I mean, it, it's based on, again, my entire life, like watching American gladiators and like wanting to be one and like being in love with Arnold Schwarzenegger and like loving muscles always. Right. And I, always like to have big muscles. And it was always like, I'm never going to get on stage and do this. I can't diet for three months. I can't get that lean. Like that doesn't sound fun to me. Like I'll just keep just getting strong and whatever. And it, mm -hmm. I think I was like 29 or something when I, it sort of switched and somebody, people have been telling me like, just go do it. Like you could do it. Like you'd be good at it. Just do it. And I was like, you know what? Why, why the hell not? Like mm -hmm. I'm almost 30. I don't have any other fitness goals. Like let's try it. I think one of the big reasons why it worked out well for me as opposed to other people is because I was relatively older getting started. I think that, um, again, the sport can be, it's so inherently dysfunctional because you are doing something that isn't super healthy to your body, um, to then go be aesthetically judged by a bunch of strangers. Like when you put it on paper, that's a pretty crazy thing to do. Right. Um, and a lot of people do, um, move into the sport for reasons of, insecurity or wanting external validation or even to make an excuse for a dysfunctional attitude towards eating and towards their body. So it's a very problematic sport for a lot of people to get into. With that said, a lot of sports can be problematic if you are insecure or if you have obsessive tendencies towards food and exercise. Um, you know, the same can be said for endurance running, the same can be said for CrossFit. It's just that this has such a 
blatantly um, aesthetic and subjective approach to the like the competitive side. Um, so I, I actually have on my um, Instagram, I have like a little like story highlight where I've like written some of my experiences and some of my like thoughts for people because I get a lot of women reaching out to me saying like, hey, I'm thinking about it. I'm on the fence. Should I try it? Just some things for people to think about when they decide if they want to go into it or not. With that said, personally, I really enjoyed the process. I did quite well. Um, I, I made it to a national level within three competitions and kind of at that point started to notice the, um, the steps that I'd have to take if I wanted to pursue it further, like if I wanted to become a pro or if I wanted to really compete on like an international stage, I'd have to supplement with things that I wasn't willing to supplement with. I'd have to um, just sort of turn it, like take, ramp it up to a, a extent that I just wasn't willing to do um, because I'd managed to do competitions and win competitions um, with very little um, physical side effects, right? Like mm. I I'd get, I'd get lean and it would be a little, you know, it's like iffy for a couple of weeks, you're too lean. Like if you, if I have like a very visible six pack, I'm, that's too lean for me yeah. to look like that. Um, but I would do it really safely. I, I did a lot of research to get a coach who was somebody that I respected and who I felt like understood. Like I, I met with this person, I got to know this person really well. Um, and we had like the communication styles were really compatible. So I felt comfortable with the coach that I had. Um, and I think that I did it. It's an extreme thing to do. And I think that I did it in the least extreme way possible um, in terms of just the, 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 um, the way that I dieted down, the way that I exercised, the way that I paid attention to my health and things like that. Um, so yeah, with that said, I mean, I, I competed a few times. I won, I won my local show. I won a provincial show in the biggest province in Canada. And then I came in the top six national, nationally in my third competition and a bun against a bunch of other women who immediately went pro. So I feel pretty good about the experience yeah. that I had and I, I loved it. I loved the experience of learning what my body's capable of and seeing it change and seeing how my body responds to things in a way that I had never done before. Um, and showing that I could, I could stick to a tough goal if I wanted to. Um, it was awesome to have all these visible muscles and like, mm -hmm. look at them, like it was super fun. Yeah. But as, as we talked about earlier, it also proved to me, uh, that it's great to have and people will like your Instagram picture and think that you're great and then they'll move on and forget and it really doesn't matter mm -hmm. that you have six-pack like no one cares as much as you think that they do um, and so yeah I mean I'd say like probably my major thought is like it's easier said than done and everyone's gonna go do what they want to do anyway but if you're truly doing it because you think having a six-pack is gonna fix your problems I mean yeah that's that's not gonna happen if you're doing it because you want to really try to stick to a tough goal and you want to see your body change and you want to have that experience and you want to take some cool pictures and then move on with your life all for it. Yeah. I think that people tend to take it too far when they don't have to, you know, it's, it's one thing we can talk about. This is a whole other topic <laughs> about how professional athletes tend to be some of the least healthy people on mm -hmm. the planet, right? They look great and they're performing really well, but they're making massive sacrifices to do what they do. And they do that knowingly and willingly because they're elite athletes and they're probably making very good money and it's a temporary thing. And those are risks that they're willing to take. Um, because of the sort of social media world that we have, I feel like a lot of amateur bodybuilders feel like they should be doing those same things to compete in a local show where they're not making any money. They're not, it's not their job. They're, you know, they're getting nothing out of this except again for maybe some fleeting validation. And to me, really injuring myself and, and, and negatively impacting my health and even my mental health, just so I can say I came third in a local show. Like that's not, that's not doing it for yeah. me, you know? So yeah. um, anyway, I, I could go all over the place. <laughs> I mean, again, like I said, I, I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. I still take with me, I still do bodybuilding workouts all the time. I'm still dabbling and on the fence with the idea of doing another one. It's been a few years now. Um, but I kind of felt like it was one of those things where I would, I was continuing to do it as long as I was continuing to learn and progress. And when I hit that sort of level where it was like, either take a bunch of gear or try to make this your job or else what are you going to do? I kind of was like, all right, I'm done here. Um, yeah. and every once in a while I sort of hit this, like, oh, it'd be nice to kind of get a six pack again and like do that. Like, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, but it, it, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And, uh, and it was a very interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, no, I love your perspective on that. Cause I think, I think that if you're, if you're going into it with the right reason, meaning like, 
for yourself and for like your own benefit and not thinking more of like the validation side of things, like what other people think, I guess, which is really hard. But like from my experience, just I, I did a photo shoot like a few like last year when I kind of went through my own transformation. So that was like the closest I've gotten or the leanest I've ever gotten. Um, but through that journey, like for me, it was just the confidence that I built when I did that, just in, not in the fact of like how I looked, but like my ability to reach a goal that I set that I never was able to reach before, just like completely changed my entire mindset. And it like changed my entire life because it gave me so much more confidence and like I just felt like a badass and yeah. that like leaked and just went into every other area of my life like my I started you know my business started growing my relationship started getting better and it all stemmed from just this underlying like I was freaking confident like in myself and everything else just started getting better and so yeah it was nice to like look yeah obviously it's nice to look good and feel good and like that's like for, like, I'm not looking for any validation. I don't think that obviously you, you know, you, when people, you know, comment on your pictures and they say nice things, you're like, Oh yeah, like that feels good. But I think the underlying thing is like, when you are doing it for yourself and for your own, like confidence building. And that for me is like the biggest thing. Cause I, you know, saw firsthand how it changed my mindset on everything else. And then like with some of the clients that I work with, when they're, kind of they're changing their body and they're starting to feel better. Like you feel better, you look better, you do better. Like that's kind of yeah. just like one of the things that I've realized over the past, you know, year or two. And it's just, it's like very empowering. And so that's kind of where, like with my clients, I work with like trying to, you know, and show them this and like realize that, you know, the better you feel about yourself and in your own body. And yes, it comes back to like the body image stuff and, you know, there's a lot out there now where it's like, you know, you shouldn't be trying to look like a model and all this stuff. But I feel like in reality, it's like, if you feel good about yourself and you feel like a freaking badass, and if you feel confident, like your entire life is just going to be better. Um, and it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean having a six pack, but like doing something that you like setting a goal for yourself and freaking following through with that goal and feeling like a badass in the, in the process, like there's nothing that's better than that, in my opinion. Um, I completely agree. I mean, I think working from a place of confidence is where you have to start. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to improve on yourself. There's nothing wrong with wanting to build a little bit of muscle or look a little bit better in your bathing suit or make a little bit more money or all of those things. But if you're, if you're trying to get there, from a place of, I hate myself until I get there. I'm not good enough until I get there. I'm gross until I get there. Like, first of all, it doesn't work because <laughs> nobody ever achieves anything by like hating themselves or someone else or shaming themselves or someone else. We all try it, but it never, never works. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I think that like finding that, that balance between like, it's totally okay to want to pursue self-improvement all the time forever. But when that pursuit is something that brings you anxiety instead of excitement. That's the line. And that's one of the things I talked about with the bodybuilding thing is like, again, like the, you could tell the people who were there for themselves and who had fun in the back, in the back, before we went out on stage, when we're all greased up and we're all taped into our suits and we're all <laughs> standing around like eating chocolate and whatever. And the people who were like, just pumped to be there and excited, like, I can't wait to go show off. And then the people who were like, oh my God, I'm like looking at everybody else and miserable and hiding. And it's like, they're there because if they don't win, that's the worst thing that ever happened to them. And the rest of us are here because like, we just crushed this. Like we just did this for 12 weeks and feel so good and are so excited. I will tell you, and you can ask anybody who was part of my like prep process and my mom who came down to watch, they were like, why are you nervous? Like, I'm nervous. You're going up on stage in a fucking bikini in like high heels. Like what? Like, are you not scared? And I was like, I'm good. I truly was good. I'm like getting up there and smiling and doing like a cute little pose is the easiest part of this. Like I just did all this other stuff and proved that I could do it. And that's what it is. So anyway, I think again, it's like, and this is something you touched on. It's something I feel really strongly about and why I love to connect with people like you and other women in the health and, and fitness industry, because I think that there's still, and this is absolutely something that men should be pursuing as well, but I think it's something that culturally comes a little easier for them because they're 
frankly, they're just raised and taught differently than women still. Um, we need to approach this fitness uh, world, whether it, you're competitive, whether you're doing bodybuilding, whether you're doing Pilates, whether you're doing a sport, mm -hmm. we need to approach it more from what the, the, func the functionality and the competence that we can build through physical endeavors rather than just how it makes us look. And look, we're all in the gym because we want to look better. That's part of it for everybody. But building competence in a sport, in a activity, in an exercise, in anything, when you're competent, you're confident. And then you look better, you move through the world better, you perform better, other people respond to you better because you're confident. Like nobody's, I'm not more popular when I have a six pack than when I don't. Most people like me better when I don't have a six pack because that's, you know, if you, if you care about that stuff. But it's the confidence. It's knowing that like, I'm not the best in the world at anything, but like I can hold my own. I'm pretty smart. I work hard. I care about things. Like that's what real confidence and confidence is. And I think that we're still so driven by how other people see us and how we look and are we the prettiest and are we the cutest? Do you have the biggest bums and like all this stuff, whatever's in fad, you know, where if it's just like, let's focus on how good our squad is and how good we are at CrossFit and how, how much we're improving at podcasting and stuff like that. Cause it's just, that's the kind of confidence that you can't fake. Anybody can look cute on an Instagram picture, but most, most of us are faking that, you know, but we can't, we can't fake being good at what we do and uh, working hard. You can't fake that. That's what real confidence is. And that's what I feel so strongly about with the people that I talk to and that I try to promote and the work that I'm trying to do. So mm -hmm. like one of the projects that I'm working on right now, and I'd love your help with it too, since you're more of a master in this area than I am, but I'm developing a, a pull-up program. So like a pull-up progression program, because that's one of my fortes. And it's something that I feel really strongly about as a skill acquisition thing for women, right? Because a lot of women have a really hard time with it. You know, we have a lot less mm -hmm. upper body strength naturally than men do. Like the average, not that fit dude could probably jump up on a pull-up bar mm -hmm. and like do a couple. That's not the case for women, right? Like we have to work really hard at it, yeah. but it's super, super empowering to be able to do it. It's such a functional movement. It makes you feel so good. And it care that kind of strength and like muscle awareness and contraction ability and all of that stuff moves like into so many other parts of fitness. Yeah. So if you can do pull-ups, it helps you in so many other ways. And it's just, it's a specific thing that I think, like you said, sort of bleeds into other mm -hmm. areas. Like you're going to be confident. You're going to learn a skill that'll work for other things. And it's a great exercise in progressive work to get to this sort of end product. And so anyway, I've been working on it for a while and a lot of, uh, I've been talking about on social media and a lot of women and some men are, are very interested in it and really excited about yeah. it. And it's something that I'm, I'm really excited to share with people and work on with people because I remember getting my first pull up. I remember getting my first muscle up or my first weighted pull up and just being so mm -hmm. pumped and so excited. And it makes me so happy. And I want other people to have that too. Yeah. So anyway, so that's one of my projects I'm working on. I'm very excited about. Oh my gosh. I love that. And I totally like, that is amazing. Yeah, help me out. Like on the, on the back end to <laughs> talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I, just, yeah, pull-ups are, like, one of the things where I'm, like, whenever I go up and do a pull-up, like, I just feel good. Like, I feel, you know, like, I just did that, and you can capable. tell, like, yeah, capable, and you just, like, yeah, you, it's just an amazing feeling, so, and I'm, I feel like we're, like, the same person, <laughs> like, we just want, like, we just want other women to, like, feel what we feel when we do yes. this, and because it's just yes. so powerful, and that's, like, what I'm trying to spread the message of just, and that's, yeah, that's one of the biggest things that I think CrossFit did for women's fitness. Like people can talk shit about CrossFit if they want to. I mean, there's certainly things you could talk shit about, but one of the things that it, it really did was show the capability of strength for women. Like we, mm -hmm. there, we live in a world that in most places and certainly before CrossFit, like we thought, okay, our physiology is different, right? Like we just have way less upper body strength. That's what, that's what it is. That's why military standards are different for women. That's why firefighter fitness standards are different for women. Like we just have to be able to hold on to a bar. Men have to be able to do 10 pull-ups, whatever, because we literally thought like we aren't made for that. And then you see professional CrossFit athletes and not professional CrossFit athletes doing 45 pound weighted pull-ups and snatching more than they weigh. And yeah. like just these incredible feats of strength that you're like, 
okay, so we've been told a bunch of bullshit. I'm sorry, I'm swearing a lot. Can I not no, swear? swear it's kind of too late. I say okay. badass like every other second. <laughs> okay, good. Because I, I really can't not swear. But anyway, so <laughs> yeah, we're seeing all these things that we've been told by everybody and just by, you know, existing in the world. Like we, we can't, you're not really, that's not really what you're built for. And then all these women are like, really? Like hold my, hold yeah, my like, water bottle. Yeah. And, and like, I remember interviewing a, um, a professional MMA fighter, a woman who for a uh, podcast, actually, I think it was paleo magazine. Um, I just basically reached out to her cause I thought she was awesome. And I'm like, yeah, we'll talk about food or whatever, but I just want to talk to you. Yeah. And I was asking her about her training and she, um, she's, five foot two, I want to say maybe five, one, five foot two, small, very athletic woman, obviously a professional MMA fighter. And she was also a firefighter for a while. And we all know that that's a pretty arduous, like, um, selection mm -hmm. process. You have to be very fit and you have to be strong. And, and almost more than that, you just have to, there are certain sort of like size issues. Like it's one thing to be strong, but if you're 140 pounds and five feet two, two, carrying a 200 pound man, it's going to be harder for you no matter how fit you are, like things like yeah. that. Right. And I remember her talking about, her name's Jody Escabel, by the way, you can look her up. She, uh, she was saying like, they gave me the women's standards and I'm like, I'm not doing that because if I'm taking this job and we pull up on a fire, like, am I going to go fight the women's fire? Like I have to be capable. I have to be able to do the things that everybody here can do. And that's the kind of thing that I really respect. Like we need to just, we, we need to not set limitations that are set by mm -hmm. somebody else anyway, that we're just blindly following because we think we can't do it. And CrossFit and, and people like her, they're proving that it's like, that's, I don't know where that arbitrary rule came from, but we're going to go out there and yeah. beat it with some hard work. So very yeah. impressive. For yeah. sure. For sure. I completely agree. I'm hundred percent on the same page. Yeah. Um, so I want to transition a little bit to kind of more the nutrition side of things. Um, so I know like I'm always <laughs> watching you on Instagram making um, your <laughs> most recent um, brains. I'm just animal, gonna... animal based animal dishes. Yeah. 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 So I want to talk about a little bit about that and like how you kind of transition. Cause obviously this, like my background is really like in the keto world and with this podcast and with my experience over the last four, five years of being in the keto space, I've transitioned to more of this idea that, you know, it's not necessarily that you have to be strict keto or in ketosis, you know, 24 seven and to still get the health benefits of that. Um, so like my goal is to really, and with this podcast reasons called Netflix and chill, um, is to really educate people on the power of being more metabolically flexible and like what that means. And in my opinion, it's really in my opinion, it should be the end goal for, for most of us, um, if, unless we're treating like some type of disease or whatever. But I want to like, tell me a little bit about your kind of nutrition journey and like, did you try keto or yeah, just bring me through it. All right. So first I just want to say that I really appreciate what you're doing with the podcast because I completely agree with you that I think metabolic flexibility should be the overarching goal for 99% of us. And I think that it's a conversation that people aren't having enough because in this world, we like to deal with extremes and we like to deal with the new, hottest, sexiest thing. And as somebody who's spent a lot of time talking to a lot of smart people in the keto world, in the paleo world, in the um, carnivore world, and you name it, even some vegans are thrown in there every now and then. I like to talk to everybody. Um, and I've tried everything so we can get to that, but I think that it's still, it's so difficult to promote something that is at its essence, just being reasonable and flexible and resilient in your health and in your diet. That's way harder than saying just eat beef for the rest of your life, because as extreme as that is, it's still just one easy rule. It's so easy to follow. And these kind of, um, fringe approaches, which again can work for individual people, they just sound more fun. Like the biohacking thing, like take a pill and it's going to make you live to be 150. Like that sounds a lot more fun than you should fast every day and like try to eat healthy food. Like no one wants to do that. That's boring. Right. So anyway, I really appreciate you doing this work because this is the important stuff. And the more people like you, maybe like me and like my friend Ben Pakulski, who has his own podcast where he's talking about like real life optimization, mm -hmm. it's, you got to just get back to basics. That's what it is. And it's hard work it's not easy to figure out the exact diet that works for you because it's bio-individual. It's 
it's very highly personalized and you need to go through the work and the time and the effort to try all of these mm -hmm. things and experiment with them properly and give them the due respect and time that they require to figure out what works for you. And no one wants to do that. So yeah. anyway, I could just keep ranting, but, um, no, I, mean, I love it. Keep going. <laughs> right. Like that's what it is. So, but I would say like, just kind of from here, like what I'm doing now and working back, basically I've always, ever since I started caring about nutrition, I've always kind of approached eating from a whole foods paleo style approach, which is just to say, I'm trying to avoid processed food. I'm trying to avoid a lot of extra sugar and overly processed crap. So the oils, the sugars, the like basically middle of a grocery store mm -hmm. kind of stuff that we can all agree is garbage and that we can enjoy some of us more or less depending on our own personal goals and, and where we are in our health. Um, but it, it always just made the most sense to me. Um, people have a hard time whenever they hear anything that sounds like a trend. So they think paleo and they think, I don't want to eat like a caveman. I'm not a caveman. Like a caveman would eat a pop tart if he could. And I'm like, yes, he would. Cause that's <laughs> delicious. But the concept of we should eat real food that is recognizable as real food and would be recognizable to our great grandparents and our great, great grandparents, you know, um, that makes sense. And so within that, there's a huge range of do you want to eat more plants? Do you want to eat more meat? Do you want to fast? Or do you want to eat six meals a day? Like that stuff doesn't really bother me. I'm not going to get worked up over that because different things are going to work for different people. And you should try to find something that makes you happy and that's sustainable. And then you can stick to, and that gives you a good quality of life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I did try, I, I spent some time doing some keto stuff because again, there was sort of like a, eight to 10 month period there where I was talking about keto on the podcast all the time. It was just really proliferating and coming into the mainstream. It was huge. And I was like, I, I, I want to try everything before I kind of can talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, and I personally did not, didn't really enjoy it too much. Um, but the interesting thing is that what my diet looks like is like basically keto adjacent. So I'm eating pretty high protein. I tend to like a more animal, um, animal foods based high protein diet. Um, I was eating high protein, quite high fat, especially by like standard American uh, standards, like much higher mm -hmm. than most people. And then quite, quite low carbs, but not so low that I would probably be in ketosis most of the time. Um, and I, I never really wanted to test my blood sugar. I never really wanted to test my ketones because I just didn't want to do that. I don't want mm -hmm. that to be a part of my sort of daily life. And I'm fortunate that I don't have to for health reasons. I wasn't having any energy crashes or digestive issues or skin problems, or I, I didn't have any needs that needed to be addressed through that kind of protocol. So it was really just, is this good for my energy? Do I enjoy it? And I found it was really interesting that a tiny tweak from what I was doing, which was like next door to keto and trying to turn it up so that it was like real keto, didn't like it, didn't like it one bit. I, uh, I found I was eating way too much fat. I found I wasn't, and this, it's not necessarily the keto's fault. It's how I approached it. Yeah. Right. Um, but I was eating too much fat. I was eating too many calories. I don't have that, you know, fat so satisfying. I can barely eat any kind of issue. That was not mm -hmm. what I was experiencing. <laughs> I was experiencing like handfuls of macadamia nuts and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I just, I just, the little tiny tweak, I just didn't like. So even dialing it back down to something that was borderline ketosis and maybe I was going in and out of it if I, you know, didn't eat that morning or if I did a really hard workout. I just, I didn't like the approach that seemed a little bit, just a little bit more strict and a little bit more restrictive than I, um, than I wanted. And interestingly enough, when I tried carnivore, I found that much easier and more pleasant to, um, to sustain, which again is so, it just goes back to what's works for you individually. Yeah. Most people would think like that's way more restrictive yeah. and weird. Um, but I didn't have a hard time with it because I wasn't thinking about macros. I wasn't thinking about anything. I was just thinking like, did this come from an animal? Okay. I can eat it. And I also always approached carnivore and I still do. Cause I still will do like carnivore resets. If I've, mm -hmm. you know, gone off the wagon a little bit and I'm eating kind of crappy or I feel crappy, that's how I'll reset instead of like a two or three day fast or something like that. I'll kind of just eat like animal foods only for a few days. Um, and I found that that made me feel really good. I always approach it, uh, trying to be as varied as possible. So like, I'm not doing the, um, uh, just like ground beef or steak thing. Like I'll eat fish and seafood and 
organ meats and chicken and pork and all of these things because I just I love all of that. So I, I find that I don't get um, I don't get bored of it as quickly. With that said, I'd probably do strict carnivore for like three to five days max, and then I'd go mm -hmm. back and add some texture and some vegetables and some other things back in. Um, but I think ultimately years and years of experimenting and learning and figuring things out and trial and error has taught me what works for me, which is different than what's going to work for other people. Um, but it's what I came to was exactly what you came to, which is what's the most important thing is having being healthy enough that you're resilient and you have flexibility to take whatever comes to you. So I was really proud over the last, probably like the last year um, when I was experimenting with some fasting that I handled it really well, I think because I'd gone through this sort of process with the lower carb and I've gone through this process with keto and carnivore and trying some different things. And I was able to, on a dime, not eat for a day and feel totally fine because my body was resilient and could, and could deal with sort of a change in my routine, right? And, I, and similarly, if I go on a vacation and I go to Europe and I decide I'm going to eat a bunch of bread and wine, I yeah. don't completely fall apart either because my body's like, okay, we got it. We get it. We see what you're doing. Like we can handle this for a little while. And that's what the flexibility is. It's the ability yeah. to not have to live to such a rigid kind of um, structure. And again, I recognize that I'm, I'm fortunate in that way because there are some people who don't have that who don't have that ability. Like some people because of autoimmune issues or mm -hmm. um, other chronic issues, like they're gonna find that they have a lot of relief being super strict. And that's great. And it's great that those options are available to people. But I think that 99% of us that are healthy and, and relatively sorted out in North America, like we don't need to be that strict and adhering to these like super uber restrictive diets. I just don't think it's necessary. Yeah, I completely agree. And my experience, again, is very similar to yours. Um, just years of trying out different things and experimenting for what works for me. And there was a period of time where I did, like when I first went keto, I was like, wow, I, I love this. Like, I'm not thinking about food all the time. Like, I just feel good. And I just kept feeling better. And then at that point, I was like, well, I don't need carbs. Like, I don't, I'm not going to bring carbs back into my life because I know from previously how I felt with them. And I kind of went down this rabbit hole and it was just like, I, I developed carb phobia, which mm -hmm. I talk a lot about in um, my keto forum program, which is one of the reasons I put together that program is because a lot, like 90% of the women who come to me, it's like they have been keto for, you know, a year or more and they're they're stuck because they're now they were fat phobic, right? And now they're carb phobic. And that's exactly where I was. And it would, it's hard because it's like you hear all these things like, oh, if you eat a carb, like you're going to blow up and all this stuff. And like, yeah, yeah. You, you will gain a little weight if you eat some carbs, if you haven't in a while, because there's all the other stuff going on with the water. Like, we can go into all that, but we don't have to. <laughs> like, carbs holding water and all that stuff, all the physiology stuff. But and that's people don't aren't ed, people aren't educated on that. So they don't understand that. And so that's why I kind of like, I was like, all right, 90% of the women who come to me have are experiencing keto and they're just stuck. Like either whether it's comes to, you know, their bot how their body looks, body trying to lose more body fat, or just like living real life and like not not being able to go to a wedding and have a piece of cake because they just they're just so scared of it. And that's when, that's the reason I created like my keto for women program to really teach women that, you know, you, and it, it's a different for women too, I believe. And I kind of go into all this, but just like, you don't have to necessarily, necessarily stay keto forever, but the kind of the, the thing that uh, most of America is kind of doing wrong, I guess you would say is that we're so, you know, the standard American diet is so high in carbs that like most of America has never been in a state of ketosis or they never tapped into their body producing ketones or being able to tap into their fat stores. So they're never able to be where we are, where it's, you know, having this metabolic flexibility advantage. So I do think there is a point in time that you do have to, you know, go keto for a little bit, or at least, you know, do some fasting and stuff like that to train your body to use to know what ketones are because if you've never been in a state of ketosis your body just doesn't understand what that is um mm -hmm. but then there's the other side of the spectrum where it's like 
you know, you can be in ketosis for years and years and years and your body starts to become a little bit less um, efficient at using carbs. And so, and also your mind, <laughs> like your mindset is like, shoot, like carb, carb phobia. And it's like this, it's kind of just like this whirlwind, whirlwind of things that are, that a lot of people are struggling with. And I think that's one of the biggest things now that um, keto has been so popular for, you know, the past year or two. And now people are starting to realize like, wow, like I benefited from it, but like, what do I do now? Because I want to go to that wedding and eat that piece of cake and not feel like I just ruined my entire life, you know? Yeah. And you don't want to just replace one fear or one um, obsession with another. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that one of the the downsides, I feel like such an old person talking about like social media is killing us all, but like we all know the downsides of social media, the comparing all these highly curated fake lives to our own and the being distracted and spending too much time on it and all of the sort of extreme views that are being promoted on social media that are kind of silly and all this stuff. But I just feel like more and more people are identifying so strongly with their diet. Um, in a way that is becoming, I don't know, just sort of problematic and unpleasant. Like it's, it's great to have so many resources on mm -hmm. the internet. It's great that we can pretty much get every answer we want online these days. And there are so many smart people willing to share and help and offer advice and offer resources. And that's fantastic. But more than ever, I feel like we're attaching so much morality and so much identity to the way we eat so that we aren't allowing ourselves to have flexibility and we aren't allowing ourselves to be to be literally flexible because if we're the keto people and someone god forbid sees us eating a sandwich yeah. then we're or a weak. sweet potato we, yeah we're weak or we sold out or we're lying or yeah. whatever and like you could go into that argument about the plant-based versus animal-based and carnivore saying that if you eat carbs, you're an idiot and vegan saying you're evil because you want to eat animals. I mean, it goes all over the place and it can get really nasty and unpleasant. And I, I you wonder why people have anxiety about what they eat. Cause it's like, no matter which decision you choose, you're terrible for one reason or another. So, and again, I think it's, it's even tougher for women because we have way more complicated physiology. Let's just call it like it is. Mm -hmm. We've got way more complicated hormones. Our situation changes from a monthly to a yearly basis, you know, depending on where we are in our lives. And we need to be able to be okay with things changing and adapting throughout our lives. So maybe keto works great for you for a year and then until it doesn't, and you have to be willing to, instead of just holding on for dear life, yeah. you have to be willing to just open it up and try it and try some different things. And, and, you know, and I think that goes for workouts, that goes for relationships, that goes for jobs, like being willing to kind of constantly let new information in and change and like take the lessons you're learning and bring them with you, but be willing to, to learn new ones too. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. <laughs> if somebody yeah. told me on the internet, if they gave me definitive proof that eating, that being a vegan was really better for my health and better for the environment, I would listen. I'm just throwing that out there. I have, I have yet to see anything that is conclusive, but I, I'm willing to listen to new things, right? Like I'm willing to mm -hmm. hear new information and try it. That's the other thing. Like I said, with the keto and carnivore thing, like you got to be willing to at least try something before you shit all over it. Like you mm -hmm. can't, you can't just say something's terrible or stupid when you don't have any basis of knowledge or understanding. So just being willing to hear every side, try things for yourself, mm -hmm. figure out what works. Yeah. And I think there's definitely like trying and, and seeing what works for you. And then also just like, like you said, with social media and just the internet and everything, there's like so many different people, you know, preaching all these different things. And that's another thing. Like when people, you know, they're like, oh, this person said this, but then this person said the opposite thing. And I don't know who to listen to and I don't know what to do. And I'm just overwhelmed. And so that's another, another kind of whole other area where people are just overwhelmed by all this different information. And it's like, I call it analysis paralysis. It's like, mm -hmm. they just, they don't know where to go. And so that's another kind of thing that's like another issue. And I think that just comes down to, you know, finding the right resources and, you know, understanding that you do have to do a little homework and educate yourself on, yep. you know, these different things. So yep. yeah, I think that's super important for sure. It's not easy, but that's the whole point of it. And this is what I try to tell people on 
paleo magazine, the podcast that I do, where I'm interviewing people from all different walks of life and people who are researching different areas of nutrition and wellness is when you feel like you are ready to be overwhelmed because you've heard 20 opposing opinions in one day and you don't know what to do, take a deep breath, take a step back. And instead of looking at it like this is insurmountable and I'm never going to be able to figure it out, think about it like this is, this is your life. This is your journey. You are making an investment via your time and effort into figuring out what works for you and everything that you're learning and everything that you're trying and doing is part of that journey. And that's exciting. You get the opportunity to learn from smart people and to try things and to try new things and to experiment and to figure out what doesn't work and to get better. And that's literally what life is. I'm describing <laughs> life. So like, don't get, yeah. don't get freaked out by it. Don't get beaten down by it. There's always going to be something you can improve and change and try again or try differently. And that's what life is. So let's just have like a positive attitude about it yeah. and be excited about it instead of overwhelmed, really. No, I love that. I love that. I think that you have another career motivational speaker because you're oh, so freaking should, good at it. Should I, be, should I be like the next Tony Robbins, like small hands Tony Robbins? Should I do it? <laughs> you should. No, for real. You. I'm just like sitting here like, wow, mic drop. Like every other word, it's like mic drop, mic drop. I appreciate that. I mean, listen, I talk for a living, so I hope that I'm like somewhat good at it. I'm trying. I'm trying. No, to. you're you're awesome. I think that whoever's listening to this is probably going away like, damn, like I'm going to go <laughs> lift a weight and eat some brains. Yes. Yes. I love that. I, that would make my day. That would make my day. Um, well, I think we've been talking for I don't even know how long, but we, I think we could probably go on forever. Um, so I guess we'll wrap it up, but I do have like a two hot seat questions for you. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. okay. So the first one is if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Okay. I do like this question, but I have to ask like a follow-up question. Are we talking like actual superhero superpowers like I could be invisible or are we talking about like things that might be more practical that I can just like make up on the spot anything anything whatever you want whatever you yeah whatever you want because like obviously I'm like oh it'd be cool to be invisible because I could go out and I wouldn't have to talk to anybody <laughs> yeah I think I mean honestly I feel like a superpower for me right now just because I'm doing a million different things and it's very topical a superpower for me would be to be indistractable not indestructible, Ooh. indistractable. Like this thing, like I wouldn't feel like I wanted to look at it every 10 minutes. I wouldn't be like on my computer and be like, oh, Netflix is also on my computer. Like if I could just, you know, cause I, I used to be able to do this like before smartphones and stuff. I used to be really good at like sitting down and reading a book for like two hours straight mm -hmm. and not thinking about a million other things. And with all of the technology and stuff that we have now, like I try real hard, but I am definitely not as good as I used to be at like focusing on one thing. So if I could have a superpower, it would be to like tune everything out for as long as I wanted so I could just do one thing. Yeah. No, I, I agree too. I, I found with the, actually the reading the book thing, that's something that I like, I would always like put it, put an hour aside in the afternoon to like read a book. Right. And it never happened. Cause I was just like, everything was going on. So now I do that first thing in the morning and I leave my phone in the other room and it's part of like my morning routine. And it's just become a habit and it just like changed everything. Like I get through a chapter a day or more. Um, so is it always has, fiction? Do you read like fiction or nonfiction or is it always like, you know, learning stuff or do you read? It's a pleasure? combination. It's mostly like self-improvement books yeah. and like motivational things. Like that's how, like when I start my morning with that, I'm like, it just, it just helps. So yeah. Um, there is one book actually, have you read the book Free to Focus by Michael Hyatt? No, I don't think I've okay. even heard of that one. I just finished, I, I actually just finished it. Um, that based off of your superpower answer, I think you'd yeah. like that one because he okay. literally it's called Free to Focus and he just takes you through all these different ideas and things to like, you know, like tips and tricks for like putting your phone like there's apps that you can download that like lock you out of your phone and just all this cool stuff. And I need all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely will read it. Another good one too is, um, digital minimalism by Cal Newport. He mm -hmm. also wrote deep work like that. That book's really good with that. Like we can, I actually interviewed him for paleo magazine. People can check that one out. It was one of my favorite interviews because he's just, he does such a good job of talking about this issue without it being like, we're all going to die. Cause we can't yeah. look at our phone. Like he's not, he's not like doom and gloom about it. He's just like, here's how we, move forward you know so, I actually yeah. just it's funny that you say that because I actually just bought that book last week oh, and that's like in my so stack to read I'm excited yeah, you're gonna like it yeah 
Okay. And the last question. Um, if you had a daily theme song that you just, you had to have a daily theme song, what would it be? So one about like eating cookies? No, I mean, I think it depends on, it depends on my mood, but I have to say the first song that kind of came to my mind is, it's a song by a rapper named Kevin Gates and the song is called, I Don't Get Tired. And that, that really <laughs> resonates with me because Again, we didn't even go down. This is like a whole other topic we could talk about, but my biggest, one of my biggest challenges is sleep. And I am like a very upregulated person. I'm pretty high energy. Like I, I've like never napped in my life. I have a hard time sleeping, but I'm never, I'm never tired. Like I see other people who talk about how they can't wait to get in bed at night and just like go to sleep. And I'm like, I have no idea what that feels like. And I know that I don't have kids. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who are like, wait till you have a kid. I'm like, probably, but I think another thing that it makes me think of though, that song is that so much of life, like we just talked about, it's about just, you just keep moving, right? Like it's momentum. It's like, you mm -hmm. just, you don't have to win every day and you don't have to be the best at anything ever, but you just have to like keep going. And it's that consistency of showing up for yourself and for other people. That's when good things start to happen. So it's like, just don't, don't get beaten down. Don't get tired. Just keep going. And that's it. Mic Love it. Another another one. It's like I wish I could take this microphone. I want to roll today. I have so much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's another superpower that you already have is like not not feeling like you need sleep or whatever. Because I wish I, I mean had that. maybe Any there's power. a downside though. Like it's it's great that I don't have like energy crashes, which I think again is metabolic flexibility. Mm -hmm. Like I just have like pretty even high energy because I I think I was just born a little bit like like people telling me to like relax all the time like calm down I'm like this is this is me relax like it's not gonna happen yeah. <laughs> um, but it is it is problematic when you have like most people are looking for stimulants and ways to like be focused and have energy during the day and I am constantly trying to find ways to like bring myself down in the evening like I've joked about it on social media like my cocktail of like things to help me get to sleep is like epic like just I'm just dropping everything in there is it gonna put me to sleep <laughs> let's see so anyway I remember seeing that out right? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. a journey. That's funny. Um, okay. So I guess I had another question, but I'm going to, I'm going to, it's been a watch. <laughs> no, your <laughs> mic drops all day. Um, so I guess what is, cause I know you have the pull-up thing coming along, but are there any, is there anything else coming that like you're excited about or something cool on the horizon? Yes. Well, speaking of brains, I have a very big announcement and this is kind of an early, uh, an early time to talk about it, but I've already talked about it on social media. So um, you'll be the first podcast I'm talking about Ooh. it with. So I'm very excited and I appreciate you letting me do this, but I signed a contract um, with a publisher. I'm going to write a cookbook. It's a book and a cookbook um, that will probably be out sometime next year. Um, I'm working feverishly to get it out as soon as possible because I'm excited and I just want it mm. to get out there. Um, but it's really kind of a, a celebration and a discussion of nose to tail eating um, specifically organ meats. So you talk about, you know, I've been posting some like very adventurous cuts of meat on my <laughs> social media because <laughs> I feel very, very strongly. I'm not trying to convince anybody to eat meat who doesn't eat meat, but the reality is most of us do eat meat and we still have a really hard time contemplating what nose to tail truly means. A lot of us are still like, we can get on board with like some steaks and we can even get on board with like meat on the bone a little bit, but the idea of eating very, very nutrient dense organ meats is seen as very extreme and very gross because culturally we're not used to it. When throughout all of history and basically every culture on the planet has utilized every part of an animal because it is the practical, respectful, economical, mm -hmm. and healthy thing to do. And we are in this very weird, um, removed from nature and very privileged pos position where we can just choose a cut to eat and never try anything else. So I'm trying really hard to just be encouraging and be open to uh, exploring new ways of eating that are, again, respectful and ethical and sustainable and healthy um, by showing people that it's fun and it's not as scary as you think and it's delicious and it's really mm -hmm. good for you. And I didn't grow up eating weird organ meats and I enjoy it and I have a lot yeah. of fun with it and I'm not a chef so if I can do it you can do it too so so that's really it it's just I'm just trying to celebrate um a more uh a better way to eat meat mm -hmm. so that's what I'm working on and uh and I and I've been telling people too I'm like you may not eat 
every recipe that's in the book, but I can pretty much guarantee that anybody I know would enjoy at least some of the recipes and you'll learn something too. So I'm very excited about it. So I'll just, I'll keep you posted as I, as I work yeah. on it. And let you know I'm excited it. about that too. I'm definitely slacking on my organ meats. I'll get I, you there. Don't yeah. Worry. I might mm -hmm. have to come spend some time with you. <laughs> oh, I can, I like, we'll virtually shake on it right now. I will get you eating liver in a way that you'll enjoy it. I'm down. I've or tried it a few back. times. <laughs> I've tried it a few times and like put it into like meatballs and stuff like that. And I didn't hate it, but mm -hmm. I was just like, I don't know. You wouldn't choose like, it every day. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. and that's the other thing too. I mean, again, we don't, I don't want to give it all away and I don't want to keep you here for another two hours, but there's also the idea that like, you don't have to, we're again, in such a privileged world where we think that everything should taste like pop tarts all the time. I don't know why I keep talking about pop tarts. <laughs> it must be on my mind, but like not everything has to be hyper palatable. Like mm -hmm. sometimes we eat food because it's nourishing and because Again, we're respecting the animal that gave its life by using all of it. And there are absolutely ways that we can eat these sort of off cuts that are more pleasant and we can hide them and we can sneak them in and we can do things. But every bite of our food, every minute of every day doesn't have to taste like the most delicious, amazing thing. Sometimes we do it because it's good for us and because mm -hmm. it makes sense, you know? So, um, but anyway, with that said, I'm, I'm telling you, there's some recipes in here that are going to surprise you. I'm excited. I'm now. Yep. You said a year in different rounds? Well, I, it's so like, so I'm, I'm still literally physically working on it now. I'm going to be done the, the, like the manuscript in the next couple of months, but I know that to get it in stores is usually like sort of a six to 10 month process. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm sure it'll be on pre-sale within, you know, a few months. Um, so best bet is to just, um, keep, you know, I'll just keep you guys posted and just follow along and I'll let you know when it's out there. Yeah. yeah and if you need any, like tips or tricks on writing a book slash recipe book. That's what my book is. It's like the first half is a book and with all the information and education, the second half is like over a hundred recipes. Um, and so let me know because I struggle a little bit with, I thought the writing part was going to be the hard part, like actually sitting down and writing, but it wasn't. The recipes are like, yeah. mm. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be so fun. Like I make all these recipes and it's, it's hard. It's hard. It, you have to, especially like the publisher I had, everything had to be like pristine and all that stuff. So if you have, yeah. if you need any tips or anything. I <laughs> appreciate that. You, yeah, we'll talk about that offline because you're right. I mean, no one, no one writes a book because they think it's going to make them a millionaire. You write a book yeah. because you really want to do it because it's a hell of a lot of work, but I, I'm so excited to do it every day. Like it's, it's a lot of work, but it's super fun and I'm learning so much. So I just, that's awesome. I can't, I can't wait till it's done already though, if that's any yeah. sign of how much work it is. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So tell um, our listeners where they can find you on social media, website, stuff like that. Awesome. Um, yeah, so my website is just ashleyvanhouten.com and you might want to put that in some show notes because no one will be able to spell my name. <laughs> sure. um, I'm very uh, responsive on Instagram and my handle is the muscle maven. And then I love also, that handle, by the way. <laughs> it Sorry. was, you know, that it was such a like, uh, it was serendipitous because I literally started Instagram to, um, to record my bodybuilding, um, adventure because I didn't want to put it on Facebook because I didn't want to annoy people with like my food pics and stuff. So yeah. like, I'll just make this completely separate. Just had a flash of inspiration and there we go. I'm the muscle maven. Anyway. Uh, so, so thank you. So people can check me out there. And then if they want to, um, check out the podcast, you can just search paleo magazine radio, wherever you listen to podcasts. And I also do some co-hosting on our pal, Ben Pakulski's mm -hmm podcast called Muscle Intelligence, which has been super, super fun. And I'm, I'm really grateful to him for um, allowing me to go on there and make fun of him once a week. <laughs> so um, that's been really fun. So yeah, check out Muscle Intelligence or Paleo Magazine Radio. Yeah, I've been listening to, I listen to you guys every week. It's just like, so it's so entertaining. And it's also like, every episode, I'm like, damn, I just learned so much. Like, this he's is a, awesome. <laughs> he's a smart dude. I mean, I don't know too many people who are as dedicated to self-improvement and learning as he is. So it's, um, it's great. I get like a little mini therapy session. And then, like I said, I get, I kind of get to like make fun of somebody in a fun way. Cause I, I respect him and he's my friend, yeah. but I kind of get to tease him in a way that like other people would be like, is she just like chirping him on, on his own podcast right now? Cause half the time he doesn't get it. So it's really fun, but no, he's fantastic. I I'm so lucky to do it. And it, it makes me so happy every week when I get to chat with him. I love it. Love it. Well, I'm definitely gonna have 
going to have to have you back on because I feel like literally we could talk for days and Mm -hmm. there's so much, you're just, mic drops all over the place. (laughs) Thank you. But thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much for, for coming on and definitely all, all our listeners go check out Ashley on the Muscle Maven Instagram, Ashley Van Van Houten. Van Van Houten. You got it. Houten. Yeah. On, uh, your website and I'll put all this in the show notes. So thank you so much for coming and we're coming on and I will chat with you soon. Thanks Rachel. Bye.